for everyone. This is our pathology grand rounds of this um, week. Um, I want to remind everyone to um, register if you want CMA credits at the end of this and also give feedback. So um, this is a real pleasure and this is a great opportunity for us to deal with images of tissue because um, Dr. Anant Matabuchi, who is um, a professor in, of um, biomedical engineering at Case Western, director of the Center for Computational Imaging and Personalized Di Diagnosis, I think is really the leader. I don't want to overstate him, Anant, but sort of one of the leaders of really using images to um, develop um, artificial intelligence algorithms to better understand structures and what, what the components of structures are and also um, um, get more information than just straight histology. So just a little bit more, a um, couple of other things that he's recognized for, and these were interesting. So um, the Prevention Magazine uh, which said your smart imaging computers for identifying lung cancer patients who need chemotherapy was one of the top medical breakthroughs of 2018. Um, Anant is also on the pathologist power list in both 2019 and 2020. And interesting, you have more than 100 patents on all of the work that you've been doing. So, um, Again, great pleasure, and I'm looking forward to all that we're going to learn from you, Anand. So please take it away as you talk about, um, you know, prognostic and predictive radiomics and pathomics, the implications for Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Very, uh, very kind introduction. I must warn everyone that after that very flattering introduction from Larry, it's probably going to be all downhill from here on. So um, just want to calibrate everyone's expectations here. Uh, no, but, uh, but thank you, Larry, for that very kind introduction. Yeah, I am um, uh, I'm on faculty of biomedical engineering at Case Western, also director of Center for Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics. Uh, I should also do a shout out to the um, the VA Medical Center. I am also a uh, proud to be a research health scientist, uh, part of the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center uh, in in Cleveland. And so um, I decided at the last minute to change my title a little bit. Um, I, I thought I'd go with the interpretive maladies, which, uh, which actually is inspired by a couple of different books. One um, was uh, a book by uh, Jhumpa Larry about a decade ago, which uh, I think um, won a Pulitzer, I think. Uh, and then uh, the, the other book, which I think a lot of you might be uh, perhaps more familiar with, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's uh, Emperor of Maladies, uh, which of course is about uh, cancer. And, and as I thought about, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing around computational pathology and AI, um, you know, I, I, I really think that, you know, AI potentially is that interpretive of maladies. And so I thought, um, I thought it appropriate to, to tweak my title just a little bit. As the saying goes, no conflict, no interest. So I'm uh, happy to report, I guess, um, that uh, we are working with a number of different companies to translate some of the technologies that we're developing, you know, out uh, into the clinic and, and help deploy these technologies. But if I'm being truly honest, uh, then I would have to say that my true disclosure is the fact that I also have a social media account. And uh, that is my Twitter handle on there. And um, uh, you will excuse me for a little bit of um, uh, sort of uh, advertising of my, uh, my social media uh, status here. But if there's anything that appeals to you over the course of this talk, and if you are on social media, uh, please feel free to give me a follow. So I want to start up by uh, first talking about cancer. I will talk about other indications as well, but um, just want to set the stage a little bit by talking about the incidence of cancer. And this is probably a statistic that a lot of you are familiar with, but the lifetime statistic of a man in the United States uh, being diagnosed with some form of cancer is one in two. For women, it's about one in three, meaning that about 40% of men and women in the US will be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. But when you actually look at the mortality on account of cancer, it's about 600,000 deaths. Now that's, that's uh, clearly a huge number and, and way too many people to lose because of cancer. But clearly there's a discrepancy between the diagnostic incidence rate of cancer 
and a mortality statistic about 600,000 deaths per year. And there are a few different reasons uh, that potentially explain this discrepancy between the diagnostic incidence rate and the actual mortality on account of cancer. One, of course, is the fact that we're doing a more aggressive job with early screening for a variety of different cancers, uh, breast cancer and lung cancer, are two cases in point where we're using imaging for uh, screening for high-risk patients uh, to try to find presence of disease early. We have better biomarkers. Um, we have biomarkers like PSA, for instance, and prostate cancer. And uh, we have better treatments like immunotherapy. But if you're being completely honest, I think we have to admit that certainly one of the reasons for the discrepancy between the diagnostic incidence rate and the mortality of on account of cancer is because of overtreatment and overdiagnosis of a number of diseases. And, and probably prostate cancer is a classic case in point where one in seven men in the US will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime, but only one in 40 will die on account of it. And most of these prostate cancers tend to be relatively indolent so that you are more likely to die with prostate cancer rather than on account of prostate cancer. And yet we end up treating a lot of these prostate cancers very aggressively. We treat them with radiation therapy, we treat them with radical prostatectomy, uh, where uh, it, while the, the fact is that the vast majority of these men might have benefited from watchful waiting or active surveillance, so really no uh, intervention at all. And the reason this is important is because these interventions can very often cause more harm than good, because every one of these interventions comes with a certain amount of risk, a certain amount of toxicity, um, at, uh, that's directed towards the patient. But it's not just the patient-centric toxicity, it's also the very real issue, uh, certainly in the United States, of financial toxicity. I mean, we've seen statistics like this where 42% of new cancer patients will lose their life savings, many of them within one year of that initial diagnosis of cancer. And so what I want to talk about today is about the utility for AI, for artificial intelligence and computational technology, uh, to play a role, not just in the diagnosis of disease, but also in its utility for uh, prognosticating disease outcome, assessing the severity of the disease, and more critically, being able to identify response to therapy and also identifying the benefit of certain more aggressive therapies like chemotherapy, for instance, because at the end of the day, it's really the development of these prognostic and predictive tools that will really ultimately help us realize the true promise of precision medicine. So unlike what a lot of other groups are doing around you know, AI, which tends to have more diagnostic focus, really identifying the presence or absence of disease, what I'm really gonna talk about is the work that we're doing in our group around using AI and computational technology more from a prognostic and a predictive perspective. Now, I want to quickly add here that this idea of prognostic tools or predictive tools is not a new concept. It's been around for a number of years, and probably the most famous uh, of these prognostic and predictive assays is the Oncotype DX assay from Genomic Health, uh, which is a multi-gene expression-based assay for identifying which uh, breast cancer patients, early-stage breast cancer patients, were going to benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy versus which patients uh, could safely avoid adjuvant chemotherapy. And this test is now, been around for about 20 years. It looks at the expression of 21 different genes and provides a risk score. And based on that risk score, a decision is then made uh, whether or not to treat with adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, this test has been uh, successful. It's, it's widely used, but comes with some challenges. It's tissue destructive. It is expensive. Uh, but also, because it involves macro dissecting a part of the tumor for doing the gene expression profiling, it has the risk that it might miss out on profiling the more aggressive components of the tumor. Uh, we know that intertumoral heterogeneity is a real issue. We know that tumors that tend to be more heterogeneous with multiple subclones tend to be more aggressive. And we know that uh, if you've got a test that samples only a part of the tumor, and that's not the most aggressive component of the tumor, then there is the risk that you're not getting a risk assessment that truly captures the true risk profile for that particular patient. With the digitization of glass slide images over the last 20 years, there now is an unprecedented opportunity to develop and apply artificial intelligence and computational pathology tools to interrogate tumor morphology 
in, in a way that really is unprecedented. And this is just a, a snapshot of some of the work that we're doing in our group. We're using concepts from network theory and, and computer science. We're able to develop algorithms that can go and identify individual cells in these h and &E images. We're able to use concepts from graph theory to look at the spatial architecture of individual cells, look at the uh, arrangement of these individual cells, how far apart from each other they are. We're able to use mathematical operations like textual analysis to look at the heterogeneity within different tissue compartments, look at the heterogeneity within stroma, within epithelium, within individual each, within each individual nucleus, and convert the entire landscape of these pathology images into a series of quantitative descriptors that now give us a, you know, a, a risk assessment of the tumor in a way that simply is not possible to do based on visual assessment of these glass slides alone. And so about a dozen years ago, I uh, had the good fortune of meeting uh, Dr. Sridhar Ganesan, a breast oncologist. And Sridhar and I were talking, and I was talking to him about some of the work we were doing in using AI to do breast cancer grading and prostate cancer grading. And when Sridhar saw some of the work I was doing, he said, well, you know, what you're doing is great, but truth be told, it's not as interesting to me because as a clinician, my major challenge is really being able to identify who is going to benefit from therapy, who is not going to benefit from therapy. Um, and so we came up with this concept of the image-based risk score or IBRIS, where the idea was that we were going to take just each of these slides that were digitized, that were acquired as part of routine clinical workup of these patients, identify patterns of aggressive disease using the IBRIS, or the image-based risk score AI algorithms, and use those patterns to then make a prediction as to who is going to benefit from um, adjuvant chemotherapy versus patients who could avoid adjuvant chemotherapy. One of the things that we needed to do was to develop tools to go in and find the individual uh, cells, the individual structures within these glass slide images. Um, everybody, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of deep learning algorithms and Essentially, the idea with these deep learning algorithms is that you've got uh, this architecture comprised of you know, multiple different layers of neurons that are all connected to each other. And essentially, by passing in a series of annotated examples to the network, the network is able to learn representations of the target of interest. So for instance, in this particular work that we published know, about five years ago, um, we were able to train a deep learning neural network to go in and find individual cells. So we essentially provided a series of annotated examples of cells on these slide images provided to the network, the network then learned patterns corresponding to those individual cells and nuclei. And the network was then able on a new set of images, identify the exact spatial location of these individual cells. So these are very powerful uh, techniques. They're relatively easy to stand up because, uh, you know, it's not complicated. You don't really have any domain knowledge that you need to know about the disease. Um, you really just need to provide annotated examples to the network. A few years ago, we then thought about trying to see whether we could challenge these deep neural networks to identify problems that were higher level. So beyond just low level image processing and segmentation, we want to see whether these neural networks could potentially go in and predict a uh, high level diagnostic tasks, for instance, try to identify which patients were going to have heart failure or not based off tissue biopsies. Uh, we wanted to look at endomyocardial biopsies to try to figure out whether we could predict the risk of heart failure or not. And so Jeff Nurschel, um, who was a student at uh, the University of Pennsylvania at the time, now is a pathology resident at Stanford, um, worked with, with my group, as well as a, a cardiologist and a radiologist at the University of Pennsylvania. And we put together a cohort of endomyocardial biopsy patients, which had a mix of both uh, normals, uh, but also failing hearts. Uh, we provided it to the neural network. There was a discovery set. The network was able to learn patterns from these endomyocardial biopsies to distinguish what was failure versus what was a normal heart. We then got an independent set of another 100 odd patients, which were used to validate the algorithm. So the set of cases came from uh, the University of Pennsylvania again. 
and we apply the same methodology uh, to the validation set. And on the validation set, the uh, classifier did a really, really amazing job. We had an area under the curve of 0.97. Uh, and this was on the independent test set. So not on the discovery set, but on the independent test set. What was really nice was that when you compared it against the pathologist, we had two cardiac pathologists who looked at those same test cases and their average area under the curve was only 0.74. So there was about 24% differential. Um, it looked like the machine classifier really knocked this one out of the park and a really, really good job. But the caveat to the story uh, is that a few months later, when we got another tranche of cases from the University of Pennsylvania and ran it through the same network, the performance decreased quite dramatically. So the accuracy went from that 97% down to 75%. So it wasn't like it was guessing. Um, it was actually in the same ballpark of where the pathologists were. But this was really staggering because nothing had really changed. We were using slides from the same lab, from the same institution, and slides were being scanned on the same scanner uh, that we had uh, scanned the initial set of pathology uh, images on. And Jeff, who thankfully is way smarter than I am, uh, after a few weeks, I uh, was able to figure out that the problem was that even though the scanner had not changed, a remote software upgrade had been applied to the scanner, which had very, very subtly changed the distribution and the color properties of the image for the second tranche of cases compared to the first. Now, visually, it didn't make a difference to the pathologist, but clearly it had had an impact on the neural network, which is why the neural network uh, saw that dramatic decrease in performance. And so that sort of really breaks into the second part of my story, which is that as we talk about AI today, invariably, most groups are really focused on so-called neural network or black box algorithms. Now, the reason they're called black boxes is because they work essentially by ingesting image data uh, that is provided to it and trying to learn the best representations to distinguish the categories of interest. But the problem is that because these are unsupervised, because of representations that they learn very often don't have an intuitive basis, it can become very difficult to figure out what exactly the network is learning and hence the term black box to describe these approaches. And there's been a lot of concern around these approaches, particularly in the context of medicine, particularly when you're looking at treatment decisions. Um, and this is a quote from Professor Jordan at UC Berkeley, uh, who says that trusting these brute force algorithms too much is a fate misplaced. And that's, that's a sentiment that's being echoed more and more by many, many groups. And, and here's an interesting example that sort of, uh, is, is sort of a case in point about how you need to uh, you know, qualify the trust that you have with regard to these uh, neural network based algorithms. Uh, this is work uh, that I came across uh, a couple of years ago. This was put out by Dr. Samir Singh at the University of California, Irvine. And a few years ago, Samir, working with his graduate student, uh, wanted to build a network to distinguish Huskies to wolves. Now, all of you will appreciate that this is a challenging problem because visually it's very difficult to tell what a Husky is, a Husky from a wolf. They look very, very similar. But Samir's student, uh, was able to pull a number of images from the internet. He trained a network, and then when he ran it on an independent test set, he found that his neural network had an accuracy of about 99% distinguishing Huskies from wolves. The Samir, uh, who clearly is, again, way smarter than me, realized very quickly that something was wrong, that this was too good a performance for a problem that was visually very difficult. And after some brainstorming, they realized that the network wasn't actually picking up any features of the face of the animal. What it was picking up was the fact that huskies invariably were on a white background, right? Huskies invariably, there was snow in the background, and that's what the network was picking up. It wasn't really picking up features of the face of the animal. It simply was picking up the fact that whenever a husky was present, uh, there was going to be a white background, uh, and if the wolf was present, there wasn't really a white background. So it really reiterates the issue of the black box nature of these deep learning algorithms. And having said that, I think I want to qualify very quickly that you know, it doesn't mean that deep learning algorithms are useless. I think that uh, they are really powerful when it comes to trying to identify individual structures and individual primitives on pathology images. 
this is a, a paper we put out uh, about five years ago where we showed the utility of these approaches for segmentation, for detection of specific structures and topology images, identifying mitotic figures, tubules, lymphocytes, nuclei from pathology images. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a huge opportunity here uh, with using these approaches to do very high throughput high throughput uh, phenotyping, high throughput identification of structures of interest. I mean, here's another example where these tools can be used to identify um, lymphocytes and cancer nuclei on these pathology images very, very rapidly, very, very quickly. Now, one of the challenges with these approaches is that uh, they are labor intensive, they are annotation hungry, and so they really require the um, the user to be able to go in and annotate examples to provide to the network. And this is challenging, particularly when you have pathologists who find it very, very difficult to find the time to do the annotations. And so one um, approach we've developed to try to address this problem is called quick annotating. So this is an interactive tool uh, which allows for an end user to port in an image, um, annotate a few examples, and based on those very few examples, a network is stood up in the background, the neural network is stood up in the background that then is able to go in and identify structures of interest or cells of interest. Those structures of interest can then be fed back to the end user. So the end user can then look at the result and figure out whether the result is acceptable or not. If the result is not acceptable, the end user can go in and use uh, interactive annotation tools to change the annotations. Um, doing that, after having done that revision, uh, the network then learns based on the updated result. And so in this interactive process, interactive procedure, we're able to converge to a uh, pretty robust network pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quickly. So um, this is uh, one of the tools that uh, our group is developing and making uh, available. So if you do a quick search for quick annotator, uh, it should come up. The, uh, the, the tool, the code is available on GitHub. Uh, papers under review, uh, but the tool is out there. And uh, please feel free uh, if, uh, if, if you're interested to download it and, and give it a try. But you know, the, the way, uh, just to come back to the point I made about deep learning, the way we've been using deep learning uh, is really in segmenting and phenotyping different types of cells. Um, so identifying not just cancer nuclei, but uh, trying to identify you know, fibroblasts, macrophages, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, and providing that sort of deep um, uh, detection segmentation results of these different cell types, which can then serve as the basis for extraction of features, interpretable intuitive features, unlike the deep learning representations, which can then be provided to the machine learning classifiers to make prognostic predictions or uh, predict treatment response. And, and here's just sort of a quick summary of some of the kinds of features that we're looking at. You know, spatial architecture plays a pretty prominent role in a lot of the tools that we're developing, uh, looking both at spatial architecture of lymphocytes and cancer cells, uh, both in the stroma as well as the epithelium. And so this is where deep learning is fantastic because it can uh, provide very robust segmentation of the epithelium, of the stroma, cancer nuclei, of lymphocytes. And once those are all segmented out, then we can use algorithms from network theory and graph theory to start to construct these spatial motifs or these spatial connections between these different cell types uh, to start to pull out signatures of features uh, that pick up quantitatively the morphology uh, of these different tissue compartments of these different cell types. So with that, let me step into a few different examples of how we're developing and applying these tools for a variety of different indications. Um, one of the uh, motifs that we're very, we've been very interested in is the role of collagen. I think that for all the uh, pathologists on the call, um, I think you know, there's, there's always been a lot of interest around the role of collagen, particularly in cancer prognosis. But the challenge is, of course, you know, it's, it's difficult to identify visually. And so what we did was to train a machine algorithm to go in and identify collagen on these h &E slides in an automated fashion. And so we looked at breast cancer patients, both uh, patients who had short-term survival versus long-term survival. We were able to use the machine learning to tease out exactly where the collagen was. We were also able to use machine learning to identify the tumor nests. 
And then we were able to capture the orientation of collagen fibers with respect to the tumor nest. And what we found, which was very interesting, was that in patients who had short-term survival, the collagen fiber orientation was very organized. So the collagen fibers were all uh, coherently organized with respect to each other, but in patients with long-term survival, who did well, there was a lack of coherence of the collagen fiber um, uh, vectors with respect to each other. It was more chaotic, more disordered, more chaotically arranged. Um, and even though this seems counterintuitive, it actually makes sense when you realize that the collagen fibers could be providing that uh, highway on which uh, you know, the cancer hitches a ride to really migrate on to different sites in the body. So um, it may well be that a more coherent organization of the collagen facilitates the migration and the transference of uh, the tumor uh, from the primary site to other sites, but a more discordant haphazard uh, highway makes it more difficult for the tumor to spread uh, from the, uh, the primary sites to the other sites in the body. And so in a paper that we currently have, uh, appears it's been provisionally accepted, um, the collagen fiber orientation was actually able to do a really good job in distinguishing patients who had favorable survival from those with unfavorable survival. And this was validated both on ECOG 2197 as well as the TCGA and over 400 patients, showing that this polarity of collagen fiber orientation was a pretty robust biomarker in predicting aggressiveness of uh, ER positive uh, breast cancers. But it's not co just collagen fiber uh, orientation alone. Again, I come back to this point about interpretability, intuitive features, and that's really informed the way we've gone about developing our AI tools. Uh, so this is work that's currently under review where uh, we developed an approach, we just presented this at USCAP as well, where we developed an approach to go in and look at those hallmarks that uh, pathologists have long recognized as being important for breast cancers. Uh, specifically, we went in and trained a machine classifier to identify uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear morphology or specifically looking at patterns of nuclear pleomorphism, but quantitatively and looking at variations in shape and size and architecture. Uh, we had a machine classifier to go in and identify tubules. We had a machine classifier to identify mitotic figures. And so by combining quantitative measurements of pleomorphism, nuclear pleomorphism, tubule count, and mitotic count, uh, we were able to create a machine classifier that then did a really good job in distinguishing poor outcome from good outcome. And uh, this was validated both on ECOP 2197, but also on a cohort of patients from the Tata Cancer Center uh, hospital in Mumbai, uh, one of the largest cancer centers in, in Asia. And so this data was really compelling because now it, it, it clearly showed that both in lymph node negative as well as in lymph node positive breast cancers, this signature was prognostic of outcome uh, and it was prognostic across data from multiple sites, including an international site. So why is this important? And so this is a little bit of my tongue in cheek comparison. So please, I hope you'll, you'll indulge me here. But why is this important? Why is this image-based risk score important? Well, one is if you look at the comparator molecular assays out there, these are expensive. And to be able to create a image-based test that only requires a digital slide image, you're talking about pennies on the dollar compared to these multi-gene expression-based assays. You're talking about a rapid turnaround test because you could run this on the cloud. You don't have to physically ship tissue. Um, you're not destroying any tissue because you're looking at an image of a slide. And therefore you could really have global impact as opposed to um, being limited in your accessibility. And so in other words, you have an inexpensive, fast, reliable, accessible prognostic breast cancer test that's priceless for everything else that's smart, there's MasterCard. Unfortunately, this joke plays out much better uh, when you're in front of an audience. Uh, it doesn't um, sound that good when you're doing the talk on Zoom, but I'll just imagine that a few folks on, on the call were smiling. Um, but it's not just the IBRIS uh, as, as a standalone test, it's also IBRIS and Oncotype compare, combined. And so combination of Oncotype and IBRIS actually improves the performance of Oncotype by 20%. Uh, we put out an abstract at ASCO a couple of years ago where we demonstrated on ECOP 2197 that the IBRIS test was able to improve the performance of Oncotype by about 20%. In other words, we were able to identify 20% more truly low-risk breast cancer patients 
uh, who could have successfully avoided adjuvant chemotherapy uh, compared to the use of the Oncotype VX test alone. And it's not just in invasive breast cancer. Uh, another uh, area we're looking at is in DCIS. And this is an area that you know, Oncotype VX has not been successful in because the Oncotype VX for DCIS is not shown to be very predictive. Our results are showing that based of features that we're pulling relating to nuclear morphology, nuclear shape, and nuclear architecture is strongly prognostic of which DCIS will go on to develop into progressive uh, invasive ductal carcinoma versus those who will not. And that's important also, not just from a prognostic, but a predictive standpoint, because the big question in DCIS, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, is knowing which of these DCIS because of the likelihood, increased likelihood to progress to invasive ductal carcinoma are going to require or benefit from radiation therapy versus which patients can successfully avoid uh, adjuvant radiation therapy. Uh, in a paper that should be coming out, hopefully by the end of this week in uh, Nature Precision Oncology, we've actually demonstrated that in looking at prostate cancer patients, over 900 patients from six sites, looking at uh, AI extracted or uh, computationally extracted features of gland morphology and gland shape and gland architecture, that we're able to distinguish which patients uh, were at risk of recurrence versus those patients who were not at risk for recurrence after surgery. Um, and not only was it prognostic in all comers, uh, but it was also specifically prognostic in margin negative patients. In other words, we were able to look at those patients who traditionally based on clinical pathologic factors are identified as relatively low risk even in that population, in that cohort, we were able to identify that these patients, uh, there were patients who um, were gonna do well, but then also identify the set of patients who are not going to do so well and who would benefit from more active um, sort of vigilance uh, and potentially could benefit from some sort of adjuvant therapy uh, following surgery. Just like the Oncotype DX test exists for breast cancer, uh, the Decipher test is a multi-gene expression-based assay for prognosis prediction of uh, prostate cancer, which is in the NCCN guidelines. And in this same paper uh, that I referenced, um, we were able to go head-to-head -head between the deciphered test and the image-based risk score. And we were able to show that we could distinguish or we could predict um, which patients were at risk of recurrence versus not with a accuracy that was very comparable to the decipher test. In other words, in a head-to-head -head comparison, the image feature, the image test um, held up very nicely against the decipher test. But when we combine the image feature of the histotyping test with Gleason score, as well as PSA, prostate-specific antigen, we were actually able to demonstrate that the com combination was able to significantly outperform the decipher. We were actually able to show that the hazard ratio was significantly higher compared to decipher. The concordance index was significantly higher. And so this was really exciting because it showed that just using simple image features from a slide coupled with PSA, coupled with decent score, could actually outperform a $3,000 test that was in the NCCM guidelines. One of the other questions that we've been looking at is where do you interrogate? Of course, we all know that the money tends to be in the tumor, but in a study that we put out with, um, with the Johns Hopkins group a few years ago, we actually were able to demonstrate that features of the tumor adjacent novel regions or benign regions um, were uh, even more prognostic of biochemical recurrence compared to the features uh, that were coming from the tumor alone. Uh, when this paper came out and whenever I've shown the data, invariably the question I get is, you know, how can you be confident that that region that was identified as normal or benign is truly normal or truly benign? And I have the same response to this question every time I get it. We did this study with the Hopkins group. Jonathan Epstein identified what was normal or benign. If you've got a question about whether that's truly normal, truly benign, take that up with Jonathan Epstein. Sorry, a little bit more Zoom humor that would have worked better in person. One uh, other paper that we put out uh, last year was in uh, clinical cancer research where we also wanted to understand whether there were differences in the morphological characteristics of prostate cancer between African-American men and Caucasian-American men. So we did a study looking at 
uh, radical prostatectomy H&E slides between Caucasian American men and African American men, and found that there were distinctive features in the stoma, so in stomal morphology, that were actually quite different between the two populations. And so when we use those differential features to build a specific risk model for African Americans, we found that that model was way more prognostic and specific for biochemical recurrence prediction in African American men compared to a, a population agnostic model. So in other words, when you didn't account for differences in um, between African American men and Caucasian American men, that uh, population agnostic model was not as prognostic in African American men compared to a, a population specific model. Just sort of reinforcing or reiterating what we're you know, seeing uh, coming out in, in, in stories and magazines and articles that you know, we have to also, as we build these AI tools, we have to be cognizant of implicit bias. Uh, and we've got to really try to understand, you know, are there differences? Where A, are we accounting for different populations when we're constructing these models? And B, are we making sure that there are specific signatures, specific features to these individual populations that are being accounted for as we're starting to create these uh, computational uh, risk models? Uh, another area we've been working on is in the area of uh, P16 positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. This is an ongoing project, uh, courtesy of a couple of R01s with uh, Dr. Jim Lewis at Vanderbilt. Uh, and Jim had uh, several years ago identified visually that multinucleation or these aggregates of large nuclei uh, was a poor, uh, was a bad hallmark or a poor hallmark, a hallmark of poor outcome in P16 positive oropharyngeal cancers. And so working with Jim, we developed a machine learning model to go in and automatically identify this multinucleation motif and created a multinucleation score or multinucleation index based of uh, machine learning. Um, this was a study that um, uh, we just put out. Uh, over a thousand patients were evaluated from seven different sites. And what was interesting was we were able to demonstrate not just the fact that uh, we could predict outcome uh, in these patients uh, significantly. What was really exciting was the fact that we were able to uh, prognosticate outcome uh, significantly in stage one disease. Now, why this is important is because P16 positive or HPV associated oropharyngeal cancers tend to typically uh, have favorable outcome. But a subset of them typically will not do that well. And one of the big questions in the radiation oncology space right now is, of course, trying to figure out which of these uh, stage one uh, cancers potentially could benefit from the intensification of therapy because the vast majority of them are going to do well. So why should you subject them to overtreatment or, or increased radiation? The problem is there's really no good way of identifying. There are no good biomarkers for identifying um, which of these stage one patients are truly low risk and therefore would benefit from the intensification of therapy. Uh, and so this is very exciting because this multinucleation motif uh, could potentially be that biomarker to identify you know, the bad players uh, versus the good players uh, in stage one disease and therefore could help identify patients who could benefit from the intensification versus those patients where the status quo probably needs to be maintained. Uh, and so this was a large study that we just published in the General Clinical Investigation just a few weeks ago. A uh, number of different sites, uh, about six or seven sites were involved uh, with over a thousand patients that we looked at uh, in the study. But it's not just multinucleation. One of the other uh, features that we've been looking at quite closely is uh, the immune landscape of these tumors. Uh, this is a paper that's currently under review where we looked at spatial architectural features of tumor infrafame lymphocytes in these P16 positive tumors, specifically looking at the spatial interplay and the spatial architecture or uh, tills with respect to cancer cells uh, and showed that when you uh, look at these graphical or network-based features, uh, that that signature also is prognostic of outcome in these uh, HPV-associated uh, head and neck cancers. Uh, and no surprise, uh, when you combine multinucleation, you combine the immune, um, uh, the spatial immune architecture signature, the combination actually does better than either biomarker alone. And so by taking these two different biomarkers and we combine them, 
Now we find that we're prognostic, not just in all comers, but we're prognostic in every individual stage group. So not just in stage one, but in stage one and stage two, as well as in stage three. So I've talked a lot about the prognostic implications of these tests, but um, here's an example in early stage non-small cell lung cancer where um, our image-based risk score or image-based features are not just prognostic, but also predictive for added benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. Um, we've developed an assay that again, looks at the spatial interplay motif of the tumor interplay lymphocytes with respect to the cancer nuclei, which was published in clinical cancer research a couple of years ago. And we showed that this uh, particular motif was strongly prognostic of outcome of recurrence in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. But I'm sure uh, all of you are aware, one of the big problems in early stage non-small cell lung cancer is trying to identify which patients will benefit from surgery alone versus those patients who will uh, benefit from surgery plus adjuvant chemotherapy, particularly patients in stage 1B. Um, and so we have a paper that uh, looks like it should be accepted pretty soon, um, where we've demonstrated not just the prognostic benefit of uh, the image features, but also the predictive benefit. So a lot of data here, uh, just sort of quickly go through this data. What we're demonstrating is that when you look at patients who got surgery alone, this is stage 1A, stage 1B, and stage 2 patients with early stage non-small cell lung cancer, that we are able to distinguish the good players in the yellow line from the bad players. And so suggesting that these patients who did poorly might have received added benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Interestingly, when you look at the patients about surgery plus chemotherapy, there's no significant difference between the two curves, but there clearly is a line suggesting that there is a subset of patients who have a low risk score for doing well. And those might be the patients who could benefit from uh, maybe avoiding adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, obviously this needs to be validated in the context of the clinical trial, but um, this data, even though it's retrospective, augurs well that this signature might not just be prognostic, but predictive as well. One of the other areas we've been looking at is in the context of checkpoint blockade and trying to identify which patients will receive benefit from checkpoint blockade based off this tumor intraclean lymphocyte signature from HME slides. Uh, this is unpublished work, uh, but I just want to share it with all of you. We've demonstrated that looking at biopsies, just baseline biopsies in uh, lung cancer patients treated with IO, that the spatial till signature was, prognot was uh, predictive of uh, response, uh, response uh, based off uh, the rhesus criteria. Interestingly, the same signature was also prognostic of overall survival in these patients. We were actually able to find, when you looked at data from three different sites, three different checkpoint blockade agents. We looked at uh, nivolumab, we looked at tezolizumab as well as pembrolizumab. Uh, in about 140 patients across three different sites, the spatial till signature was also prognostic of outcome, but it may be more than that. It may also be predictive. So this is a relatively small subset of patients from that bigger group where we also had pdl one stats. And when we looked at these patients, specifically looked at patients uh, in, uh, who had low PDL1, we were able to find that the signature was also prognostic in the low PDL1 group. Um, and again, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that right now, in the context of IO, you know, if you're PDL1 high, you're clearly a candidate for immunotherapy. If you're PDL1 low, either you don't get the immunotherapy or you get some combination of immunotherapy and chemotherapy. But our data is suggesting that there might be a subset of patients who, even though they're PDL1 low, might actually do well. And these might be the patients who could potentially be candidates for monotherapy. So again, these might be patients who could possibly avoid chemotherapy uh, and might benefit from uh, uh, monotherapy IO alone. One of the other questions uh, we've also uh, been trying to understand is, well, what exactly are we picking up with these spatial tail signatures? Now, everything I've shown you so far has been based on these slide images. But the intriguing question here is, you know, what exactly are we capturing uh, in terms of subsets of tails from these h &E images? So we did a study with Kurt Schalper and David Rim at Yale, uh, papers under review, where we looked at 
these spatial signatures of tumor and fluid lymph sites from these HD images. But we also had corresponding quantitative immunofluorescence images corresponding to the HEs. So we were able to go in, identify a signature uh, that was prognostic both in adenocarcinomas as well as famous cell cancers. And then by co registering the HEs with a quantitative immunofluorescence, we were able to spatially map the individual tails from the HE to the QIF images. And so we were able to get essentially a phenotyping of what type of tail that was, whether it was a CD8 positive, CD4 positive, CD3 positive, CD20 positive, et cetera, et cetera. And what was interesting was there were unique prognostic signatures that emerged on the HEs that were different between adenocarcinomas as well as famous cell cancers. But interestingly, the signatures were also different in terms of the immune subtype composition. So it turns out that CD4 positivity and CD8 positivity dominated the, adeno, uh, the squamous cell cancers, but the adenocarcinomas were dominated uh, primarily by the CD4 positive uh, immune cells. Uh, we've taken the same signature and applied it to gynecologic cancers and predicting response to checkpoint blockade for cervical, ovarian, and endometrial cancers. Uh, and in ASCO last year, we were able to demonstrate that the same signature that I showed you in the context of lung cancer was also prognostic of outcome in the context of gynecologic cancers treated with checkpoint blockade. In this particular study, all these patients were treated with nivolumab. I also want to do a quick shout out to an uh, ongoing project um, with uh, Dr. Jonathan Liu at UW. Um, uh, Nick Reader, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Truth, um, where we are looking at this amazing technology that um, Dr. Liu and his colleagues have developed at UW, uh, light sheet microscopy. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this technology. And so last year, uh, we were the recipient of a DOD grant uh, to start to understand with AI and this light sheet microscopy data, uh, whether there were differences in the morphologic appearance of prostate cancer in African-American men versus Caucasian-American men. Uh, so far, our data looks very promising. We're finding uh, that there are significant differences in the appearance of individual glands um, between uh, malignant glands and benign glands. We also have some very, very preliminary data suggesting that uh, patterns of arrangement in 3D of these glands is uh, strongly associated with biochemical vitality. So talk about pathology, just in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to touch on some of the work um, that uh, was also going on in our lab in the area of radiomics or radiographic imaging. Um, just a, a couple of examples here, just whet your appetite. One of the problems we're looking at in our group is trying to understand whether there are patterns that could be pulled out from radiologic images like MRI scans that could distinguish between very similar looking presentations. So for instance, in the context of GBMs or glioblastoma multiforme, uh, patients are treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and then these patients will come back after therapy and get an MRI scan. The problem is that very often on that follow-up MRI scan, something shows up. And now the big question for the neuro oncologist is, you know, what is that? Is that a recurrence of the tumor or is that radiation necrosis, which is just a, a really an, uh, an effect of the radiation therapy? And because it's very difficult to help visually, very often the neurosurgeon has to go in and extract a piece of tissue through an intracranial biopsy, which obviously is invasive, it's traumatic, it's expensive. In this work, we decided to look at uh, a set of uh, features that we developed called collage, which look at the textual appearance of um, these images, so specifically the way it works, is that at every pixel, we're able to compute the strongest edge if you think of every pixel, it's learned by nine other pixels, eight other pixels. And with respect to the center pixel, you can compute eight different edges. And we're able to identify the strongest edge at every pixel location. And that's what we see here. Uh, then we're able to borrow the idea of entropy from high school physics, what we call entropy essentially is a reflection of the amount of order or disorder in the system. So if you want a high entropy, high degree of disorder, if you want a low entropy, it means that the system is more organized. Uh, and so we're able to create these entropy maps that essentially tell us about the relative order or disorder in these images. Uh, you can see here that the red represents a high degree of disorder, high entropy, blue means much lower um, entropy. And so it turns out that if you see a lot of red, 
Uh, the disorder is reflective of recurrence of the cancer. Radiation necrosis, on the other hand, is characterized by um, a much lower degree of entropy. We've taken this approach, applied it to lung cancers, and shown that the features both inside the tumor, the entropy features inside the tumor, as well as outside the tumor on CT scans, is both prognostic of recurrence, but also predictive of added benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy, particularly in early stage non-small cell lung cancers. Uh, we've shown recently that this pattern of appearance on CT scans from baseline CT scans is also predictive of response to checkpoint blockade in non-small cell lung cancer. This is a multi-site study we published in Cancer Immunology Research and also demonstrated that the signature was not just predictive of response, but also prognostic of overall survival. Um, just as I showed you with the, uh, with the tissue images, we've also uh, done a study in stage three non-small cell lung cancers looking at chemotherapy and uh, followed by radiation, followed by good value map and found that even in the combination therapy setting, we could identify uh, patients who were going to respond well versus patients who were not going to respond that well. Uh, similar to the work I showed you with the biopsies, we also looked at low PDL1 and high PDL1 expression, found that in both groups, low PDL1 as well as high PDL1, uh, the signature was strongly prognostic, again, suggesting that in the low PDL1 group, um, that we might potentially be able to identify patients who could possibly avoid chemotherapy uh, and maybe just uh, consider regimen comprised radiation and checkpoint blockade alone. Uh, finally, one of the other uh, motifs that we've been looking at and trying to characterize on uh, these radiologic scans uh, relates to the tortuosity and the twistedness of the vessels associated with the tumor. Uh, a few years ago, we made the breakthrough that when you look at the tortuosity of these vessels, um, the twistedness was actually an indicator of how malignant the tumor was. We started working on this in the context of lung cancer, but now I've um, looked at other cancers as well. And so in this work, we showed that the twistedness of the tumor-associated vasculature was strongly associated with likelihood of response to new adjuvant chemotherapy in the context of breast cancer. Um, again, in the context of checkpoint blockade, we found that when you look at uh, CT scans of patients um, with lung cancer, if you look at a baseline CT scan, the twistedness of the vasculature associated with the tumor is a strong indicator of the likelihood of response. The more twisted it is, the worse the response, the less twisted it is, the better the response. And that twistedness is also strongly associated with overall survival as well as PDL1 expression. And so with that, I'll conclude. So hopefully what I've conveyed is that computational analytics with routine imaging can help address questions in precision medicine, specifically prognosis and predicting response to therapy. Uh, I think a big advantage of these tools is the fact that they're low cost. And because they're low cost means that there is uh, a potential for global impact, especially in low and middle income countries. I try to make the case today that you know, uh, we really need to look at interpretable features, intuitive features, and also really explore association of these features across length scales. The, how the features on a biopsy relate to what you're seeing on a CT scan or an MRI scan. And conversely, how does that feature relate to what's happening at a molecular level uh, or at a pathway level? Because I think from a clinical decision support perspective, establishing the morphologic and molecular basis of these imaging features is going to be critical to ultimately drive uh, clinical adoption. And so with that, I want to just do a shout out to the amazing uh, students, postdocs, faculty, staff that I have the honor and pleasure of working with on a daily basis, my amazing group at the Center for Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics. And of course, you always thank the people who put food on the table. So just a shout out to the various funding agencies that have made this work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anand. That's wonderful. Um, for those of us who, who spend uh, most of our diagnostic time looking at images, I, I find this just um, very stimulating and, and very uh, uh, much a, a producer of hypotheses. So let's see, we have, uh, I'm just looking for chat questions and I'm not seeing any. So while um, people pose their questions, 
um, let me just ask you a couple of things. So um, over the years, there have been a number of uh, publications. I remember a Dutch pathologist, uh, I think a couple of decades ago, coming out with a whole set of image parameters. Um, nothing to the degree of um, uh, sophistication that you're looking at them. But um, one of the challenges, I guess, is to see if the clinical findings, the clinical outcome can be validated to a level independent of the institution of the set of um, histologic stains, those parameters that you discussed. And yeah, yeah, have, yeah. have you begun doing that? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Larry. I think that you know the, the multi-duplication example that I gave, the work that we're doing with um, you know, Jim Lewis at Vanderbilt and, and others, I think is a classic case in point. You know, it started with a hypothesis. It started with a uh, uh, a finding by a pathologist looking at a series of these slides. But one of the things that Jim realized is that you know he couldn't do it reproducibly. Or even if he could do it, yeah, you know he, he couldn't have his colleagues. You know their assessments are going to be off. And so you know to me that's sort of a classic case in point, which which just sort of you know makes the the case that you made, where you know it's an opportunity to then take what we learn and. I mean, I think that you know one of, one of the things that I'm always surprised by is how much you know pathologists uh, have learned. You know, you, you guys have been doing this for over a hundred years, right? And of course, when I say you guys, I mean I'm not talking about <laughs> right. literally here, but but you know, yeah. pathology has been you know been practiced for for over a hundred years, and there's a significant brain trust there, significant amount of domain knowledge that we have, and I think this is the opportunity to think about how do we start to quantitate and make reproducible assessments of the domain knowledge. And this is, this is why I'm, I'm a little critical of sort of the black box kind of approach because we're leaving so much of this really valuable domain knowledge that exists uh, and that I think can be modeled. But, but to your point, Larry, I think that the critical piece then with the AI with the machine learning is to make sure that it's validated across different sites, across different institutions, mm -hmm across various sources of pre-analytic variants. And that's something that we've been very deliberate about. So some of our studies coming out now, a lot of the technical work was actually done you know, a few years ago, but it's taken a while to publish these things because we wanted to do it right. And what I mean by that is we want to make sure that when we put the papers out, you know, data was coming from six or seven different sites and that we were able to demonstrate across multiple institutions that the signature was not just a flash in the pan, that actually held up to you know, sources of you know, scanner variants and lab variants and pre-analytic source of variants. So I would say that you know, the, the important thing here is to make sure that when these are validated, it's not just having a large amount of data. It's really making sure that the data is this, the models are validated on a plurality of sites. I think that is really the critical piece here. Yeah. yeah. There's Great. a question in the chat box. Uh, there is, yeah. Ray Monad is asking, one of my colleagues. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. I think the, the question is about uh, entropy and combining the approach with um, you know, other edge-based features in GPM. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, that collage was just one particular feature that uh, I wanted I, I showed. But uh, you know, a lot of what we're doing is really on combining multiple different types of approaches. I mean, there are multiple different. Uh, edge operations uh, that have been around for decades now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one of the things that we've been trying to look at is, you know, how can you look at multiple different categories of approaches? So for instance, I showed the example with vessels. So there's a series of measurements you can get from vessels that are measurements you can get from the morphologic uh, heterogeneity, you know, using collage or other edge-based or other texture-based operations. But then there are other things as well. I mean, in GBMs, for instance, we're also looking at deformation. You know, the tumor induces a deformation around it. And right. So we're finding yeah. ways in which you can use image processing to try to capture that deformation. So what we're trying to do now is to take these various different categories of image features and combine them into a multi, uh, multi-variable predictor mm -hmm. of outcome. I, yeah. I see Ray is on. Did you want to come? No, no, I, I really enjoyed the talk because I think you touched, uh, as Larry has highlighted, so many important aspects of this field that I think have not gotten adequate attention. Um, just one quick follow-up before I let Eleanor jump on here. Um, 
I was really intrigued by the, um, uh, you know, the giant cell scoring in the context of head and neck cancer. And is this something that you've seen outside of that context that might be practically useful in other tumor types? Um, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I mean, whatever little bit of morphology I know about head and neck cancers is solely due to Dr. Jim Lewis at Vanderbilt. Um, I, I, I would direct, uh, he's, he's obviously not on the call, but I would direct that question to him. It is, I, I don't know. I mean, the, sh the, the short answer is I don't know, but we are looking to try to explore that motif in other cancers as well. So mm -hmm. some of the motifs have held up. So for instance, the collagen fiber orientation, we've got a paper that we're sending out right now where we've taken that approach and applied it to endomyocardial biopsy. So we validated it in breast cancers, but it also seems to hold in cardiac pathology. And so that's, that's really nice. The TIL feature, I think I showed several different examples where the TIL and the immune mm -hmm. response plays a role in multiple different types mm -hmm. of indications. Uh, the multinucleation, I think, you know, we, we'll have to see. We'll have to see whether it, it shows up in other indications as well. We, wanna, we just got a grant in oral cavity squamous cell cancers. Uh, so those would be the P16 negative tumors. Um, so one thing that we want to try to see is whether, you know, this, this sort of, this, these aggregates of nuclei will show up in those other uh, P16 negative cancers as well. Yeah. So the yeah. short answer is I don't know, but we will be. Mm -hmm. This is why we need to keep working together, right? <laughs> thanks, thanks again for the talk. Sure, sure. Let's see. And then, um, Eleanor Ten, one, one of uh, my colleagues who deals with sarcomas, has a sarcoma yes. model. Yeah, so I think that the question here is about tumor head change affected by radiology correlated with molecular findings. Yeah, so we put out a few papers there. Um, we, we actually put something out in clinical cancer research last year, where we did a very extensive radiogenomic study in brain tumors. Uh, the senior author on that was Pallavi Tuwari. Uh, we looked at GBMs and um, we, we looked at the pathway analysis uh, and connected it with the, uh, the radiomics. Uh, and shown uh, sort of a really strong association between uh, you know, genes and, and specific biological pathways. Uh, so we've, we've done that in GBMs, we've, we're, we're doing that in lung cancers as well, looking at the association with PDL1 expression, for instance. Um, so, you know, I think that there is, it's not perfect, uh, but I think in many cases you do see that there are, there's evidence that molecular heterogeneity is reflected in morphologic heterogeneity on the tissue slides, which in turn is then reflected in radiographic heterogeneity on the radiologic scan. So it's sort of this concept of multi-scale association, you know, across radiology, pathology down to the molecular scales. Yeah. So, so Anant, um, now, now that you've motivated so many of us in, in anatomic pathology to begin looking at AI techniques, and given the fact that there are a lot of off-the-shelf items, can any of us begin doing it, just uh, pulling something off the shelf when yeah, you uh, aren't immediately available? Yeah, so I think that you know, the, there are tools out there. Uh, you know, we, we had a chance to talk about some of those last week, right, Larry? Right, uh, right. But, uh, but you know, I mean, there's some amazing tools. Uh, and just a shout out to some other tools that, you know, um, not, that have not come out from my lab. Which is just amazing. Uh, QPath uh, is an amazing tool developed by Pete Bankhead uh, you know, out of um, Northern Ireland, um, and you know he's he's very very dedicated to uh, upkeep of this tool. Uh, I think it's an amazing uh, uh, resource, an amazing tool. Uh, we're putting out some tools as well in the in the uh, sort of open source uh, arena. I talked about the quick annotator tool. Another tool, um, if you like, it perhaps may not be. Um, as useful for investigation, but uh, just for fun, we've developed something called Quick Annotator. If you are um, develop, uh, if, uh, de sorry, uh, developed something called HistoQC, which is a quality assessment tool for digital slide images. So essentially, once your slides are digitized, the big question is, is that a computationally worthy slide or not? Mm -hmm. So uh, HistoQC was a tool we put out a couple of years ago. It's got some traction now, completely free, download it, use it. Um, and you know it can tell you at a slide level whether you know slide is compromised or not, but it can also tell you um, in a more granular level, for instance, if there are cracks in the glass, if there are pen markings, mm. if there are um, you know hair follicles. Uh, you know it was amazing. It, it was interesting. You know, we started we, we developed HistoQC because we saw all these papers coming out saying you know we've 
run the analysis on TCGA on thousands of slides on TCGA. And when we were looking at slides from the TCGA, we just found there were so many slides that were just not computationally worthy. I mean, they were just so compromised. They were frozen, all sorts of problems. And so it just, we were just, we were just uh, bewildered. I mean, like, you know, what, 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 are they, what are they analyzing? I mean, what exactly is being analyzed? Um, you know, they just seem to sort of suck in, ingest all these slides and then run them. <laughs> and so that's why we started, his, we developed Histo QC because uh, we just found, you know, all kinds of artifacts in these slides. Uh, so that's now, we just had a paper come out a few months ago showing application of that for nephropathology. In fact, just before I got on this call, uh, I was on the KPMP uh, meeting, the annual meeting for the Kidney Precision Medicine Pathology Group, which interestingly is also being run through University of Washington, Seattle, um, where um, you know my student was actually showcasing the history QC tool oh. for kidney biopsies. So, yeah. Very good. Let's see if anyone else has, has a question, please uh, um, speak up or put it in the chat. Um, let me ask you just one final question. We're already running over, but if I could take another moment of time. And that is, I think of many of your observations being very much uh, hypothesis generating, you know, wondering what the mechanism is. Have some of them led to that? Um, just finding what the mechanisms are, for example, of a collagen orientation and why that leads to a different tumor behavior. Yeah, yeah. Like, so that's yeah. a great question. Yeah, great question, Larry. So I mean, I'll be honest. I think that you know, my I mean, I'm a I'm a uh, sort of a, a card holding bioengineer, biomedical engineer, uh, and so as part of that, you know, my 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 mission um, my mission statement is, is translation. So I you know I've come I come at a lot of this from a very sort of translational perspective. You know, how do we move these tools out? But we are starting to look at some of the mechanistic underpinnings of these discoveries. What do they mean? Um, because I think that apart from you know being hypothesis generation, hypothesis generating, it may also have implications for you know how we treat patients or combinations of drugs, for instance, mm -hmm. the vascular network, right? So you look at you know, more twisted seems to suggest polar response. Well, then the logical question is, could you untwist it? And if somehow you were able to combine immunotherapy uh, with you know. Uh, you know, a, 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 another complement that potentially allows for that untwisting to happen, uh, then, you know, is that, is that response going to somehow be better? So it's, it's, it's something that's intriguing. We are starting to do a little bit of that with the collagen. Uh, in fact, we're working with Richard Levinson. You know, oh, sure. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. yeah. And so well, Richard is very famous, right? Uh, not least for the pigeons, right? Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but Richard is, is, is also extremely uh, smart when it comes to imaging and developing novel imaging equipment. You know, he yeah. developed the MUSE technology, he's got a collagen um, imaging technology. So he's actually scanning some of, his, some of our slides on, his, on uh, his microscopes. And so we're gonna now be analyzing the collagen fiber orientation on those scopes. Um, so yeah, I think that you know, it, it, it sets the stage for a lot of those hypotheses a generation which you know clearly have to be followed up on um and so we, we're we, you know we might do some of that um but i again like i said you know i think my my primary interest is you know, how can we develop tools to you know address yeah. some of the unmet clinical need uh particularly for our clinicians our oncologists appreciate it and if you have another moment i see another question rose in chat sure. can you Do you see the question? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. How do you make these more interpretable? So, I think that that's the. Um, I think that's that's what we've we've taken. You know, we've taken a very different approach to a lot of what is, you know, coming out, which is more sort of deep learning, right? So, it's deep learning can predict uh, chromosomal, you know, instability, can predict uh, you know MSI stable, MSI unstable tumors, and all of that, and it's fantastic. Um, I think just as a bioengineer, and I, I, I truly don't mean to, you know, be deprecatory or condescending here. But my challenge with a lot of these approaches is that when you don't understand what is happening under the hood or how the AI is achieving its prediction, 
Yeah, there's always this concern. And that's why I, sh I started with that example in you know, myocardial biopsies, where we got a prediction, but we didn't understand how the model was arriving at its prediction. And that's why when it failed, we just didn't know what was going on. And I think that the challenge is, I mean, if you're pragmatic, it is all, these AI models will always fail. And the question is, when it fails, are you able to figure out why it failed? Right? That's the critical question. And so very deliberately, the approaches we've taken are, are somewhat different compared to what a lot of other groups are doing, which is to really infuse domain knowledge uh, into the construction of these models, really going in with features, attributes that uh, are connected to the pathobiology of the disease that are known in terms of their prognostic relevance. Uh, I gave the example in breast cancer, right? I mean, for breast cancer, I mean, you look at Bloom Richardson grading, you look at the Nottingham grading scheme, I mean, how old is that? Right. I mean, it's been around for, for decades now. And we know it's nuclear pleomorphism, mitotic index, tubule formation. And so when we were thinking about creating a model to predict outcomes, we said, well, we know that breast cancer grade is prognostic. We know the problem is it's not very reproducible, but it is prognostic. So if you can come up with a way of quantitating that, then you know exactly what's going into the model. You know that it's, it's a measurement related to nuclear pleomorphism, mitotic index, and tubule density. And so we've taken the approach up front to make sure that we infuse interpretable features into the model. Now, the other category of approaches that a lot of other groups are taking is we'll build our model and then try to figure out what the interpretability is. That some seems very counterintuitive to me, right? So you, you know, and then this is based on these sort of what are called visual attention maps. You try to figure out where the network is looking. And it, it just seems a lot of conjecture it's not clear to me that that's really what it is. Um, in fact, we have some data showing these visual attention maps can keep bouncing around um, and they're not very stable. So every time you run the classifier, it looks like the network's looking at different, different part of the image. So- That's a really that's interesting not, point, yeah. That's right, that's right. So that's, that's the approach that we've taken here. Yeah. Just go in with interpretable features to begin with, as opposed to the black box. Yes. Thank Super. You. I have a question, thank you, Anand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. So uh, I've seen some of most of the papers, they take the attention or the uh, phenotypic clustering as the in interpretability for uh, showing that these are the areas are, are responsible for prediction of prognosis. Yeah. I think uh, the one, the approach you said, like looking at more of a domain knowledge, like how the cell structures, other uh, components are distributed, that makes really sense. And lot many works have not been done, but most people are working on like different and like more of it. It's like yeah, related to our attention, which is not really useful. I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it could. I mean, it could be again. It could be interesting. I think that uh, we still have a way to go. I know there's a lot of. I mean, I don't mean to be little. A lot of active efforts right now in the deep learning space to try to, you know, focus on interpretability. Yeah, I just I'm a little skeptical about the visual attention map because I mean, our data has shown that visual attention maps can change quite significantly when you change your training set. Okay. Um, and um, I, I think that you know, if, you're, if you're talking about interpretability of these deep learning networks, you, know, you have to look beyond visual attention maps. It can't just be based on these attention maps. Uh, and th there are efforts, but I think they're still nascent. I think it's still evolving. Um, yeah. you know, it, it'll be exciting. I, I mean, if I think we can uh, make more progress on that front, um, I think there'll be a huge opportunity to converge, you know, these sort of handcrafted approaches that I presented today with these more interpretable deep learning uh, architectures. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sure, great. Okay, Anand, you, you have certainly filled what an hour, and, hour and a quarter at least with uh, really motivating stuff. Sure. Appreciate it again. And uh, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. All right. Okay, thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Bye now.